I just really, before I start, want to acknowledge how privileged I feel to be part of this and also to um, uh, to acknowledge what a wonderful job the Leukaemia Blood Cancer do for patients and make our jobs as treaters of leukaemia easy. And so, again, it is a privilege to be here. Um, I, this was when I was asked to talk, I, I wanted to use this title, and Emma was a bit uncomfortable with this, on the assumption that I was saying something about you, but I'm quite particular about apostrophes. This is about one idiot, not lots of idiots. <laughs> and no one in 2017 can have a slide with that title and not be tempted to do that. Um, <laughs> but just to even things up a bit, when they said they needed an updated photo, I just sort of, you know, I banged off a selfie and sent it off, and I'm slightly embarrassed to see that most people have a much more professional looking photo in the brochure than that. <laughs> but it got me thinking, you know, what does the President of the United States and I have in common? And I, I came up with two things. One is we've got the same degree of baldness. Um, we just deal with it differently. And, um, <laughs> You, you may notice the moment more observant amongst you, there's been a bit of a hairdressing issue in Palmy, and uh, my clippers have broken down, so I'm growing it out a bit at the moment, and I'm just wondering about that as an option. <laughs> and the other thing, which is really the point of the slide, it's not actually everything I say, and this is strictly true. Um, there's sort of a spectrum of untruth, though. There's sort of blatant lies, and then at one end of the spectrum, there's oversimplification. I guess that's where I'm going to focus. I'm doing blood cancers in their treatment in 30 minutes, so um, it's going to be a lot of oversimplification and I apologise for that in advance. Because, as the President said, nobody knew healthcare, blood cancers could be so complicated. Whereas I think everybody knew that actually, but anyway. So advance apologies to the President uh, and his supporter. I think statistically there's one in the room and I'm really sorry if I offended you. Um, but this is going to be a bit light-hearted in parts, but I really want to acknowledge the individual people living with blood cancers, their whanau and friends. And it's about generalisations. I wouldn't sort of look at something I've put here and say, hell, that's something important to me. And, you know, my doctor said one thing and, and our speaker said another. It's really a very general talk. And it's really just based on discussions I've had with patients over about 25 years now, trying to understand the cancers, how they develop, and, and what we try and do about them. And looking to the future a wee bit, but basing a lot of this on, on treatments that are currently available in this country, but a little bit to the future at the end. I want to apologise to Shakespeare and Oscar Wilde and lovers of monkeys, horses and mice, and the reasons for that will become apparent as I go on. <laughs> so the first question is, where do blood cancers come from? You know, do they come from outer space? Are they sort of something that we catch in the environment? Do we get them from other people? And, and none of those things are true. They actually come from ourselves. So blood cancers, like all cancers, develop from our own cells. And, and blood cancers occur when normal cells in the bone marrow and the immune system start behaving abnormally. And abnormal cell behaviour is actually driven by genes, mutated genes. Now, these are not genes you pass on to your kids. These are genes and cells in our body which have mutations or mistakes occur which make cells behave badly. And you need to have a vague understanding of DNA, chromosomes and genes. And this is a sort of picture I stole from the internet. Um, and basically, I think most people are familiar with that cells have a nucleus. And within that nucleus, there are this complex molecule called DNA, which is a huge molecule, three billion uh, paired bases, these C's, G's, A's and T's, and they're sort of subdivided into, into chunks we call genes, and genes code for proteins, which is what makes cells different from each other. So every cell in our body has a complete copy of that blueprint that makes us different from, from monkeys or worms or cabbages, um, and, and different cells behave differently because different genes are expressed or, or active in different, in, in different cells. So muscle cells express different genes, have different proteins, in their, in their cells than, say, brain cells, which is what makes them different. And some genes are actually really important for making cells multiply and, and growing fast when we need them to, and also for dying when we need them to. And genes can be switched on or off by mistakes in the DNA, we call those mutations. So that's a bit of background, I guess. So how do blood cancers develop? We think that all cancers and all blood cancers start off as a single cell that starts to behave a bit abnormally and reproduces. So that one cell becomes millions of cells. We call that a clone because it starts off as one cell. To develop a full-blown cancer, you need a clone of cells to sort of start behaving very badly. And in the early stages, they don't behave that badly. So the sort of things that cells do in blood cancers is they proliferate out of control, they grow out of control. They can fail to grow up properly. They can fail to die when they should do. And these processes are all controlled by genes, which lead to bad behaviour when mutations in those critical genes occur. 
And we think it probably requires multiple, multiple hits. You don't develop a cancer through one genetic mutation. We think we acquire these, and it's an arbitrary figure. Maybe five to 10 is a sort of minimum number to develop a full-blown leukemia or, or cancer. And we, we sort of collect these as time goes on. And this sort of, as now I'm going to sort of slightly, this is the bit about monkeys and Shakespeare. Everyone sort of heard the story, that, and it's theoretically possible if you had a, a million monkeys with a million typewriters typing randomly for a million years, theoretically, they could just about produce the complete works of Shakespeare by chance. Now that's very unlikely, but it's, it's theoretically possible. So if you consider a bone marrow cell as a car that's idling with the engine running and it's sitting still, and it's being hit randomly by a monkey with a big hammer, you're going to have to bear with me on this. <laughs> and the thing about the monkeys is it's random. The monkey doesn't know what it's hitting with the hammer. Here's our car idling, the motor's just running quietly, and the monkey hits it with a hammer randomly, and what happens when you've got billions of cars idling with the motor running and billions of monkeys hitting them with hammers? Well, most of those hits do nothing. They actually make a bit of damage to the paint loss. The engine keeps idling. Nothing happens. And in fact, panel beaters can come and repair the damage. Some hits, though, will actually stop the engine. They'll, if a random hit will take out a fuel line or knock out a spark plug. I know nothing about cars, but I suspect that'll stop an engine. And, and those, those are much, much less common. And that's not a problem. Occasional hits will sort of jam the accelerator so the revs go up a bit. And then very rarely you'll get a hit that actually knocks the car into gear. And then the car takes off, and that's a problem. And if you think about bone marrow cells as that car that's idling and sustaining these random hits to their DNA, and most of them don't do anything. Most mutations don't affect important parts of the DNA. And repair mechanisms can actually repair that often. Occasional mutation will be in a critical gene and the cell just dies. Now that's not a problem because there are actually millions of others doing the same job. Very rarely a mutation in a critical gene will make that cell grow abnormally. It might divide faster than it should do, it might die sooner than it should do, it might not grow up as it should do, it might not repair the other mutations properly, it might not die when it should do. And multiple mutations in the same cell eventually can lead to bad behaviour. So blood cancers sort of develop when we accumulate enough of these mutations to really make behaviour go badly. The car can sort of take off, if you like. And we only really, sometimes we only see the fully developed cancer when all the, accumulation, the, all the mutations have occurred. So what we call de novo, or out of, out of, sort of from new or out of the blue, leukaemia appears from nowhere. But probably the, those cells have been accumulating mutations leading up to the time when it becomes really obvious. But sometimes we see preliminary phases of blood cancer. So there's a condition called MGUS, or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And we know that about 10% of people aged over 80 have got one of these. And myelodysplastic and myeloproliferative syndromes, early chronic lymphocytic leukaemia, these are, these are actually relatively common. And I guess developing a more aggressive blood cancer is a bit like winning lotto. It's sort of losing, really, but it's a bit like winning lotto. Well, you need six numbers to win lotto, and you're getting a ticket every week. And if you've got a precursor disease like a myelodysplastic syndrome, you've, got a, got a, you've already got a couple of numbers. And it's not inevitable that you're going to win lotto, but you've got a higher chance that somebody hasn't got the numbers. And if you've got a really high-risk myelodysplastic syndrome, you know, you've got four or five numbers, then there's a very high chance that disease will evolve into leukaemia. And we think that's happening to people who develop leukaemia without an obvious precursor disease. We just don't see it always. So winning's not inevitable, but it's more common and people have already got some mutations, and sometimes we can see that. What do the mutations make blood cancer cells do that they shouldn't do? Well, they can reproduce too fast. And here's a list of diseases where the real problem is that the, the bone marrow cells are, are reproducing too much. We're making too many cells, chronic myeloid leukaemia, polycythemia, essential thrombocythemia, and many high-grade leukaemias and lymphomas. They can stop growing up properly. Acute leukaemia, I often say, is a bit like a household full of three-year-olds that are reproducing. So the cells get blocked at a certain stage of their growth, don't grow up, and that causes chaos quickly. Myelodysplastic syndromes, the problem really is that the cells don't live long enough to get out into the blood and do anything useful. And they can live a lot longer than they used to. Some of the lower grade diseases like low grade lymphoma, CLL, the real problem is the cells don't die when they should. So that's really a background into sort of blood cancers and how we think they develop. And I guess it's a background to sort of looking at how we might treat cancers. I want to talk about conventional chemotherapy first because that's what our mainstay of treatment is still. And these, generally act, these drugs generally act on dividing cells, and they poison key elements in cell division. And they're relatively nonspecific, so they actually affect normal cells. Uh, chemotherapy was developed um, to uh, originally 
to attack cells which were dividing, because that's what cancer cells do. And cells of the gut are also dividing. The normal cells in the bone marrow are also dividing. So effects on the bone marrow of the gut, and obviously the hair follicles where cells are dividing to make hair in some people, um, the, um, they can have effects on that. We've moved on a bit, and we're now starting to introduce what we call targeted therapies. And these are designed to have specific activity against some aspect of the cancer cell that's different. So as we understand these genetic changes and can sort of look at what that means in terms of what makes the cancer cell different, we can actually now start to target those differences in the cells, and it's much more specific treatment. And finally, the immune system is a very powerful way of getting rid of things out of our body. And there is a lot of interest now in immune therapies to harness the immune system to attack the cancer cells. So cell division is very complicated. When a cell divides, one cell divides into two, which cancer cells are doing all the time. It's a very complex process. It requires lots of enzymes. It requires that huge molecule of three billion base pairs to be unraveled, a new copy made, and then get raveled up again, turned into, uh, packaged up into these things called chromosomes, and then separated out in, into the two individual cells. It's a very complex process with lots of different enzymes and proteins involved. And conventional chemotherapy drugs largely target that mechanism. They get at cells that are dividing rapidly. So how do they work? They take advantage of the fact that cancer cells are dividing rapidly. And they take advantage of the fact that cancer cells are not as tough as normal cells. So again, I'm going to have a flight of ideas here. We're going to go to the races. So how does chemotherapy work? Well, if you think of a normal bone marrow cell, it's like a Clydesdale. It's tough, it's a bit slow. And this is an acute leukemia cell. It's a racehorse. And on a good track, in fair weather, the racehorse is going to win that race. Um, and the problem is we don't yet have racehorse-specific poison. I'm going to talk a bit about some things that are getting there later. And, but racehorses, because they've, they, they've traded away a lot of that resilience, a lot of that toughness for speed, and so they're sort of show ponies. So these are the contenders in the race. And conventional chemotherapy, this is a crude analogy, but we just even things up a bit. So you know, we dig some ditches and put some barbed wire and some landmines in the way, and that's conventional chemotherapy. And you know, that gives the, the, the Clydesdale actually a bit of a chance, because it's much better at getting over that than the racehorse. And this is sort of a model, if you look at that, we've got sort of on one axis the cell numbers, and in the bottom a, a time course of months. And we've got a level of disease we call remission, which is where we can't see it, and a level down the bottom of cure, which is where we've got rid of the disease permanently. And we start with lots of leukaemia cells, and not so many normal cells. And then we give treatment, which we call induction treatment, this is a conventional chemotherapy. Now that poisons both the normal cells and the leukaemia cells. But what happens next is the key. Because if you look at the shape of that recovery, the normal cells recover faster. And you see that after a month, we've actually got a remission. So the leukaemia cells are now below that line where we can see them, and the normal cells have recovered to a better level than when we started. We don't stop there. We give another sort of course of chemotherapy. We call this consolidation. And the same thing happens. And the same thing happens again. And you see that the, the difference between these two curves is growing with each course of treatment. And if things go our way, we give a second course and we get rid of the disease. It disappears below that line where the last leukaemia cell is killed and the normal cells recover. Now that's in an ideal world and that does happen. This is how we treat acute myeloid leukaemia with conventional chemotherapy. Sometimes it doesn't go so well and the repeated course of chemotherapy don't get rid of the disease. The disease is more resilient than, than, it, than that in some people. And you see that we're, we're, as soon as we stop treatment, that leukaemia is going to take over and win again. We have a way around that. Um, we can predict that sometimes in advance. We can tell from some people um, before we start the treatment that the genetic changes in the leukemia cells, which we can increasingly measure, predict that we're not going to be able to cure the disease with just repeated cycles of chemotherapy. And nowadays we're, we can actually measure that. Uh, we used to rely on looking down a microscope to see residual leukemia. Now there are quite sensitive techniques for saying there are still some leukemia cells here. You're going to have to do something different. And there's something different we've done traditionally is this, it's a bone marrow transplant. And the principle of bone marrow transplantation is you give a really big dose of chemotherapy and or radiotherapy and you wipe out the leukemia. The problem is you wipe out the normal bone marrow as well because it's very sensitive to chemotherapy. But then you rescue it, so your recovery is from someone else's stem cells or sometimes from cells that we put in the freezer from the person. So that's the principle of a bone marrow transplant, to get us back down to that cure level but not have to worry about the normal cells recovering. We use some other, other cells to do the recovering. How do we improve on conventional chemotherapy? And this really slide reflects what happened, or well, the next couple of slides happened in the 1980s and 90s. And the question is if a few drugs are good, what about more? 
So since the 1960s, multiple myeloma treatment, um, what's called Alexanian treatment, which is named after Dr. Alexanian, is oral melphalan and prednisone tablets every four to six weeks. Um, and for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the commonest form of lymph aggressive lymphoma, we have this combination of drugs called CHOP, and I think everyone knows that each of those letters stands for a drug. So C stands for cyclophosphamide, H stands for, believe it or not, doxorubicin. It's called hydroxy something, which is why we get an H. And O stands for oncovin and P for prednisone. And they're both reasonably effective, but they're far from perfect. We didn't get as good a result as we'd like in everybody. So what people did in the 1980s and 90s, they started adding, or 70s, 80s and 90s, they started adding more conventional chemotherapy drugs to these reasonably good basic recipes. And I remember using a thing called ABCM. Uh, some people use CHOPM. PCAB was an Australian recipe we followed for a bit. Each of these letters stands for a drug. There was a thing called m back -op. And then things really got weird, where the Americans used my personal favourite, Promace Cytobomb. I never used that. Um, <laughs> I did give VBMCP VBAD once or twice, that we used to call that M2, it was kind of a euphemism. I prefer to call those regimens EBTKS, which is everything but the kitchen sink. <laughs> and if you bear with me, this is a bit like pizza. You know, pizza's quite good food if it keep it simple. Um, you know, three or four ingredients. This is modern pizza, and you can see why we've got a problem with this. There's an awful lot more going on there, but it's an awful lot more toxic and probably no better for you. So less is more, I guess, is the theme. So this idea more and more drugs, hopefully with different activity, might kill more cancer cells, hasn't really proven. And studies have shown that these really complex and, and intensive treatments didn't really add much to our basic. So what next? Well, a better understanding of cancer cells has allowed us to develop these targeted therapies I've talked about. And there's a comp you don't really need to know the details, but there is this group of um, enzymes called tyrosine kinases, and they're involving sending signals to cell nuclei. And if, this is a picture of them. Essentially, at times we need to switch on cell division. So if I have an infection, my bone marrow needs to start making more white blood cells to fight that. Um, if I lose some blood, my bone marrow needs to start making some more red blood cells. And the way that happens is signals come from outside the cell and pass through these complex mechanisms we call tyrosine kinases and switch on the nucleus. But the best way of thinking of it is just like a switch. It's generally off, but occasionally gets switched on when you need it to be. And in chronic myeloid leukemia is a classic example when this goes wrong. We'll bring our monkey back. Um, during that phase where the chromosomes, where the DNA in the, in the cells is, is divided into chromosomes, occasionally a piece of chromosome 9 gets broken off and switched with a piece of chromosome 22, and you end up with this thing called the, it's called the Philadelphia chromosome, because that was described first in Philadelphia. But what that does is actually take a gene called uh, BCR on chromosome 22 and a gene called ABLE on chromosome 9 and shoves them together where they should not be. In a normal cell, they may as well be on different planets, but they stick them together and what you create is a, a switch that's jammed on. It's an abnormal tyrosine kinase. And it's, it causes uncontrolled cell proliferation, and it's typical of chronic myeloid leukaemia. And the key thing about chronic myeloid leukaemia is it's a very simple disease because everybody has that mutation. It's, it's universal. And if you don't have that mutation, you don't have this disease. And that's actually really important. And what happened is clever doctors, as a Dr. Druker in Portland, figured, and the picture doesn't matter, but basically there's this sort of pocket in this BCR able which binds a chemical called ATP, and this drug, imatinib, was de developed, which binds that pocket and stops that chemical binding and really switches off the switch, essentially. And this was hailed as a miracle cure, and it really has been a remarkable improvement. In a front page of time, this is the new era, we've got the magic bullets. And certainly Gleevec, uh, as it's called, um, we call it Matnib is the trade name, has been a remarkable um, outcome. These things, people may be familiar with this, what we call a survival curve, and it's, you start with 100% of people alive, and with time people start to die, so the percentage goes down. And in the old days, and I, I remember these days, um, we had sort of chemotherapy drugs and interferon, which was very toxic. You know, we didn't do very well, and this new drug really has made a dramatic improvement to the outcome of people with this disease. So why don't we design magic bullets for all cancers? And the problem is that most cancers are much more complex than CML. Um, most, very few have a unique mutation like that. Many have multiple mutations, so you target one, there are other mutations which are active and, and it doesn't work. But they are being used. Um, I think in the blood cancer area, the 
drug called Ibrutinib, which we're using in clinical trials and also on compassionate access in this country, is a remarkable new advance in that disease and in other diseases, which targets a, a different um, a protein called the B cell receptor complex. And that's proving very valuable uh, as part of our treatment. We still don't have funded access to that in this country. Another targeted drug many people in this room will be familiar with is bortezomib. This is called a proteasome inhibitor. And basically, proteasomes are sort of like a rubbish tin. It's like, think of an insincorator, which gets rid of unwanted proteins in a cell. And in some cancer cells, myeloma, there are important proteins which force cells to die, which are broken down by the proteasomes. And if you inhibit that, you can actually cause the cancer cells to die. And again, another survival curve, um, adding um, Bortezomib to our standard mix, melphalan and prednisone, has had remarkable increase in pr improved outcomes. So it's much better than throwing the kitchen sink at it and a heck of a lot less toxic. I want to talk about this group of drugs because these are new but it's really quite exciting. It's the BCL2 inhibitors and, and the one that we've used a little bit in trials in this country is called venetoclax. And I guess it's this group of diseases where the problem is not so much the cells are dividing too rapidly, but they don't die. And, and most blood cells are designed to live for only a short time and then they die by a process that's called apoptosis. And the immune system can overcome that because we need some cells to live for a long time in our immune system. So if I get a tetanus vaccine five years ago, the reason that I will see tetanus and get rid of it is because there are long-lived cells called memory cells which my immune system has created by activating this gene called BCL2. So it's a normal part of what we need to do to have a, uh, an immune system and a memory. But some cancers activate that gene inappropriately, so they actually live a lot longer than they should do. And they actually gradually accumulate. So some lymphomas and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the problem is these cells which are living longer than they should gradually accumulate, fill up the bone marrow and fill up the lymph nodes. So what if we could switch that signal off? It's the live too long signal. And you know, you wonder what on earth this is about. He's got a fine head of hair, hasn't he? Um, and you know, whenever I'm giving a talk, I always think of my friends from the Muppets, what they're thinking and thinking, you know, what this is Oscar Wilde, what's he got to do with it? This guy's saying, is he is the speaker actually a haematologist? And I wonder myself at times. <laughs> but some people know Oscar Wilde wrote plays. We also wrote a novel called The Picture of Dorian Gray. And this is about a young man who sort of had a, paint, a portrait of himself painted, and he wished that it could grow old instead of him. And that's exactly what happened. So basically the portrait of an attic was getting older and older and Dorian was keeping his youthful good looks. And he was actually a bit of a pig of a man, I have to say, and he did some terrible things and eventually felt really bad about it. So he rushed up the attic and destroyed the painting. And when he did that, he suddenly aged 100 years and dropped dead. And that's kind of what venetoclax does to these cells in our immune system, is that they actually switch off that anti-aging gene and the cells die rapidly. And the problem we've had with initial studies that's so active is that the cells die so rapidly we actually get into trouble. The cells release all sorts of chemicals and cause problems. And so this is very exciting. We've used it a little bit in trials and um, you know, we hope that in the future we might be able to use it. But that's an area of, of treatment, targeted treatment, which is looking quite exciting. Briefly want to touch on monoclonal antibodies. And I guess this is taking advantage of the fact that our immune system is very good at recognising things that don't belong to us, bugs, viruses other people's kidneys if we transplant them, etc. Um, and the immune system makes a very specific antibody, so it actually is designed to make very specific antibody proteins that destroy foreign things but don't react with our own cells. So what if we could make antibodies against cancer cells, and what about if we could do that in mice? And that's what monoclonal antibodies are. Um, basically we take a mouse and we vaccinate it with some human cancer cells, and the mouse makes antibodies against them. And this is from, um, the, I think they teach this at GCSE in, in, in the UK, and they, they say that the spleen cells in the mouse are collected by an operation. I have to say it must be a very delicate operation. I suspect it's not, it doesn't end well for the mouse. Um, but the cells that are making these antibodies against the human cells are made, and then they're fused with a cell line which makes them grow indefinitely. And then we can sort of grow them up, and you have to muck around with it a bit, but you can actually harvest those antibodies which are actually being made to attack human cancer cells. And that's the principle of monoclonal antibodies. And the one that's best known is rituximab. It's an anti-CD20 antibody. And CD20 is a protein that's present on most lymphoma and CLL cells. It's also present a bit on normal cells of the immune system, but isn't present on many other cells in the body, so it's relatively specific. So it doesn't affect a lot of cell types. And you can get some allergic reactions to it, because it was fundamentally a mouse protein originally, uh, particularly with the first dose. 
And it has a bit of an effect on immunity, so it can affect people, their susceptibility to hepatitis B if they've had it in the past. But it's, it's pretty specific. It doesn't have widespread effects on the body like conventional chemotherapy drugs. And again, there's a whole load of survival curves from around the world which just show the blue lines on all of these are dramatically better than the orange lines. So this is CHOP and you add rituximab to it, rather than the kitchen sink you get dramatically better outcomes. There are lots of others coming. We're using obinutuzumab, we have access to that, it's funded in this country for chronic lymphocytic leukaemia. My personal favourite, gemtuzumab ozogamycin, which is called Mylotag. That's actually slightly clever because it's an antibody which has a poison attached to it, this um, ozogamycin. So it really targets the poison to the cells that we need rather than being spread around the body. Um, there's another one called brentuximab, which is quite exciting for Hodgkin disease, and daratumumab, elatumumab. These are quite exciting drugs in myeloma. None of these, apart from obinutuzumab and the Mylotag, are available in this country. Mylotag we're giving to people in the AML19 trial. Uh, which people are entering into. Immune therapy, I've, I've already told you about this immune therapy, but I've talked about harnessing a mouse's immune system, but what about our own immune system? And it's a very powerful, potentially a very powerful way to attack cancers. And, and the, the advantage of using the immune system is that it's less affected by sort of complex changes that occur in cells. If you design a specific target for one of those jam switches, and there's another mutation which means your target, your, your drug doesn't work, it's much more unstable, whereas using the immune system coming from outside the cell, it's much less affected by those subtle changes that occur in cancer cells. So we'll go back to the races. So we've got our contenders here. Before I talked about evening things up a bit, well, using the immune system really is just like bringing on the ref, the stewards. They say, actually, this is not a fair race. This is, you know, on your bike, uh, out of here to the racehorse. There's nothing sort of too toxic about this. Um, so it's really using the immune system's ability to recognise them for and say this is not a fair race, that horse has no business being in this race and gets rid of it. And I've talked about monoclonal antibodies. Our modern allogeneic stem cell transplant, that stem cell transplant using other people's stem cells, it's really major activity is through the immune system. So although we use high doses of chemotherapy and radiotherapy to try and get rid of the cancer cells, a lot of the activity of transplantation is actually the donor's immune cells recognising any residual leukaemia cells as foreign and getting rid of them. So that's really a type of immune therapy. And what it means is we can do much less intensive treatment before a transplant. We don't need to give those mega doses to try and wipe out the last leukaemia cell. We just have to give enough to let the donor immune system take over. And that's called reduced intensity conditioning, or RIC transplants. And what's that done is allow us to um, because it's much less toxic in the early stages, we actually can expand the age group. When I started in haematology, the sort of upper limit of age for an allogeneic transplant from someone else was about 40, which I thought was convenient about the age of the haematologists. And as I've gone through my career, it's now into the 60s, so it's kind of just tracking quite nicely with the age of the haematologists. But that's due to technical advances. And everyone's heard about, you may have heard about checkpoint inhibitors. The, the big news, this is the group of drugs that have been in the news about melanoma. And again, the, the, our immune system doesn't attack our own cells because it has these checkpoints. These, uh, they're sort of in blue there, those proteins stop that, that blue cell at the bottom, which is an immune cell trying to kill that cancer cell. Um, and if we can inhibit that checkpoint, and that's what the checkpoint inhibitors do, they break that bond, then the, the T cell, the blue cell, can kill that cancer cell. It sort of un, uncouples that thing that the cancer cell has done to make the T cells think that it's part of our own body. And that's a very powerful treatment, they're called checkpoint inhibitors, and in melanoma and certainly in Hodgkin lymphoma are very promising and there's a lot of other diseases where these drugs are being trialled. Very, very powerful way of attacking the, the uh, cancer. And then finally, I'm, this is really my last slide, this has been in the news really, um, if you can take human cells, T cells out of the body, you can engineer them, they, they add things which are called chimeric antigen receptors, and I don't even begin to understand this, but you can muck around with them to jazz them up so that they don't like the cancer that's in the body, and then you expand them and give them back. And that's been really exciting, and the FDA have just licensed this treatment for uh, childhood acute lymphoblastic leukaemia where there have been really dramatic results. And this is possibly the future of cancer treatment. And these are exciting, but in the words of one of the former Pharmac medical directors, these are eye-wateringly expensive, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the take-home message is it, blood cancers develop from normal blood cells. They're caused by random mutations in genes that control cell growth and death. Conventional chemotherapy takes advantage of the fact that normal cells are tougher than cancer cells. Targeted therapies are designed to be more specific targeted known differences between cancer cells and normal cells. 
And immune therapy uses the immune system to recognise cancer cells as foreign and reject them. So, had enough? <laughs> Why not let's do this and deliver for New Zealanders with blood cancer better together? And there's an elephant in the room, and I haven't touched on this, but it is an elephant in the room, and that's money. And these, t these new therapies are very expensive, and I think all countries, not just New Zealand, all countries are really struggling with how these how these, these treatments are going to be funded um, because they are very expensive. But we'll keep fighting for that, those battles. And this is my final slide, I promise. Um, and, I th I, you know, Prue said you heard something here first. My wife came up with an idea, um, a novel fundraising idea for the LBC. I wondered about asking the Commander-in-Chief to fund the Shave for a Cure campaign. <laughs> and then I thought about it, and as I've said, I've had a bit of a problem with my own hair, and this... this when you don't cut your hair for a while, it sort of naturally gravitates over the bald patches. It knows that you need protection from the sun. And, you know, this is unlikely. And my wife suggested, why don't you do a comb over for a cure? <laughs> Where sort of ageing gentlemen like myself sort of grow their hair for a year before shaving. And the beauty of that is that someone actually might notice. Um, and, and I guess it just, this talk's really been all about the sort of science and, and, and it doesn't get to the heart of really what I think most of this meeting is about is the effect of these cancers and the treatments on people's lives. And I guess that the reason that shaving for a cure doesn't really mean much for me is because I don't feel that bad about losing my hair. But I think I might feel quite bad about having a haircut like that for about a year. So thank you very much. <laughs>